Well, I'm Rick. And I'm Linda. <laughs> and we're gone again. Hey, listen, we're still here in Britt, Iowa, although today is the last day of the National Hobo Convention, and everybody is... Packing up. And everybody's... Heading out. Heading out to wherever they came from, all parts of the country. One direction or another. While we were here, we talked to some really in interesting individuals. And one of them, his name is Michael. And we want to feature him in this video. Michael is, um, he's pretty different. He, he's, uh, not only does he uh, consider himself a hobo, but he's also a bushcrafter. And he does it in the way of his ancestors which uh, I found to be very intriguing. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. This is Michael. I hope you enjoy it. You consider yourself a hobo like the, the yeah. rest, like everybody else? Yeah, definitely. Do a lot, have you done a lot of writing, you know? I've done a few. Um, I, last couple of months, last year and a half, I've been like at my grandma's helping her get rid of her um, hoarding supply of uh, knickknackies and stuff. Like, I've been updated on her condition since I've been here about her being in the hospital with internal bleeding. Oh. So, but I've been traveling for seven years, um, traveling by any means necessary. You know, hitchhiking, freight train, Greyhound, scam track. Out exploring. Yeah, just doing it. What got you started doing it? I just always thought there's more to life than the nine to five, you know, like, you know, like we've always been like a nomadic people, yeah. you know, and it's just in the last like couple centuries that we've like settled down and stuff. I feel like, you know, so it's just always been there's something more to it than just wake up, go to work, go home, you know, like that song that came out on, I don't know, the Tiki Tacky Boxes by um, um, Mary something, I think her name was. Um, however you like you wake up you you go to you go to work in your 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 box you know you work in a box you sleep in a box you bathe in a box every facet of life they keep you contained yeah. and i'm just like there's so much more outside you know there's so much more to see so much more to discover yeah and like they make you wait till you're you're in retirement time to go be able to see things and it's just like by that time your body's not able to go see that you know you're right you're talking to somebody that relates to that. Yeah. That, that happened to me when I when I graduated from high school. I had a job all lined up because I in high school I was taking uh, vocational automotive, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and I I went to work the the Monday after I graduated on Saturday. I I went to work at a full time job and oh boy I was happy, and I remember working for a month or six weeks or something like that and then kind of stopping and looking around me at all these guys in greasy coveralls and I was thinking wait a minute <laughs> what what do they do that's what do they do that's fun you right. know and, and then I talked to them they say well we get we get a week's vacation every year yeah and I was thinking oh goodness that isn't going to cut it yeah <laughs> you know and it, it changed my life and that and uh, they were you know not that I didn't stop working. You have to work, you know. But yeah. But I I started taking lots of time in my life for going out and exploring, you know. And it was just like, you know, lots of time. And, yeah. And it, 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 I made it so that I, I I worked for myself so that I mm -hmm. could so that I could check out for a month or two months at a time and just go. But yeah. Hey, um, as for riding the rails, uh, when did you start doing that? Um, I think like it was like. My, like a year and a half in, I caught my first one. Um, and then like, I think six months later, I caught my second one. And then it was another year before I caught my, my third one, I think. I've only been on like a handful. Mm -hmm. um, like I've ridden the whole High Line. Um, I've ridden in Texas. I've ridden um, in, out of Florida a couple times. Um, yeah, I've been on a handful. Like I don't, I don't claim to be like a, a hardcore train rider like gotcha. some of these people. I mean, like I definitely want to do it more, but um. By I the way, we're, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. I didn't inter introduce you. We're talking to Michael. He's also known as Kilt Man. Yep. But I just wanted to hear his story, and he's going to show us his kit, what he carries with him. Who showed you how to catch how to catch a ride? Um. 
I was in Texas and these two girls showed me how to hop a train. Um, yeah, I was in the middle of courts and we hitchhiked down to Texas and caught our first train and like we ended up going the wrong way at first. So we had to like hop back the other way. But where we got off the first time, uh, like Mohannes, Texas or whatever I think it was, um, the person who housed us up taught me how to flint nap in like an evening and he like started me off on glass and stuff and he like explained to me the, hi the history and the evolution of the different points and stuff, oh, which cool. I've kind of forgot since then, but I've always like thought about that experience, you know? Yeah. And it was a super, super awesome, you know? Um, and I like, he was, I had him and he was like probably like seven weeks old at that time. Um, yeah, and um, how old is he now? He's gonna be seven, seven oh, you've years. Had him for a while, dude. Yeah, I've had yeah. him for a long time. He's been all over the country with me, all, all the states, like forty-eight states. I mean, that's like Pennsylvania and stuff like that, um, mm -hmm. Maine and stuff. I haven't been to Alaska, Hawaii, but I've been, I've been to pretty much all of them, and you know, um, I usually hang out like in the winters in like Oregon and Washington, like Southern Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, in the winter time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty mild for yeah. winter, you know. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in Wisconsin, you know, so like. Oh yeah, so it is mild. <laughs> yeah, and like I'll be out there wearing a kilt and a cut off like this, and they're like, "Aren't you cold?" And I'm like, "Dude, where I come from, people drive their cars out on the ice and put tents and put their Xboxes and space heaters out there and yeah, they do live out on the ice, dude. Like, they take their four wheelers and do donuts out on the ice. So like, they'll be out there to like, like the middle of spring to even like when it's like." You can see like chunks of ice just like falling into the water and you'll still see shanties out on the ice and they'd be like fishing and I'm like, no, thank you. You want to show us your kit? Yeah, I'm down. All right, let's go yeah. do that. Okay. Sounds good. Michael's going to give us a little more idea what he's all about. And he's going to show us what it is that he carries. All right, so this is called the Great Kilt, the Philly Moor. Uh, it's the Scottish Hope Warriors um, everyday blanket, bedroll, everything in one. How long is it? Uh, six yards. And um, you start by pleating it, laying out the, the plaid, and then you'd pleat it up like so. And it's the belted plaid. And um, the colors that are in it are traditional plants from the Scottish Highlands that they extracted to make dye to create a somewhat camouflage pattern-ish. And um, the, the pleats trap warm air pockets for extra insulation. Wool retains 50 to 80 percent of its insulation factor even when wet. It expands and creates more insulation, and um, if it gets like freezing temperatures, you'll get like a, a crusty layer on the outside, which kind of acts as like a wind barrier. Um, um, yeah, um, lost my train of thought. Um, so, yeah, it's their bedroll, everything in one. And this forms into a kilt. Yep, the traditional great kilt, the Philly Moor. And the small kilt is something like the Philly Bag or something like that. Oh, I got you. And that came out later in the later, like, 18, 1800s, the time period that I kind of go after. Is like around 1745 with like the Jacobite uprising. Um, and after that, after they lost the Jacobite uprising, um, the whole Scottish culture was pretty much snubbed out. So like a, a lot of it got lost throughout history. But um, so this, this is it when it's basically first put on. Um, and you can take these front pieces right here, take them and tuck them in the back. And then you get these nice little pockets, right? And then cool. you can take the back tail piece right here, flip it up like like so, 
and you can either tie it or pin it like such and then you get a little pocket back here for a backpack and then if the weather kind of gets kind of nasty you can drop it down pull it up and over like such you got a little anorak amazing. or a shawl that's amazing and then if it gets even crazier than that drop these two po pockets put them in a knot like such and then you get a little hood and sleeves and then you don't even have to take it off to go to sleep necessarily you can just kind of curl up under a tree or under a bridge just like that and then um it contains a lot of extra lanolin which is the natural oil in a sheep sheep's wool that re repels the water um and then for my my bedroll setup I use um, the Scottish red deer pelt and this wax canvas shelter half. Um, and I hold it all together with another piece of a squared canvas. And then... So is that like a poncho? Yeah, it's a Polish surplus from World War II. Like such. Oh yeah. Yeah, and it serves many purposes too. Yep, yep serves as a ground cloth if you need it yep that's cool yeah um, and then on my bedroll strap I got a old surplus compass that's my favorite compass I got one of those too yeah just right over there in the car I like to get the tritium ones over the phosphoric ones because you got the the 15 year glow yeah without having to charge it by sunlight very cool yeah and then moving on with my kit I got this Polish army bread bag or haversack that I keep my my cook stove in and um, some snare wire and a little alcohol stove that I I run with uh, this Trangia, yeah, yep. something like that. Yep, and then I have this little firebox stove. The older school hobos used, used to use coffee cans for this. Um, that it folds, folds smaller and flatter. Yeah. Flat, yeah. And then you got your little um, tray that you set it on. And um, it can run on um, wood gas or it can run on alcohol or it can run on sterno whatever you know yeah very cool yeah um yeah this came in handy cooking many meals on the, on the side of the tracks or at a squat or wherever yeah i'm into stoves myself so yeah that's, that's pretty cool a little firebox like that is nice yeah um and then like i've had a couple different ones of them but this one seems to be the most efficient that i've had so far yeah cool and then for starting like fires in camp when i'm out in, in the bush i have this Primitive fire steel kit with some fibrous tinder, um, old fairies wrap, fairies wrap uh, striker, and a piece of flint that, um, I don't know if you guys are able to see that, but there's some sparks coming off that, and in combination with either char cloth or some charred punk wood, you can catch an ember and put it in your, your tinder bundle and stoke it up. And then I also have a couple blanket pins to keep my, my blanket roll together while I'm sleeping in the windy conditions. Very good. Um, That's my favorite way to start a fire. It's, it's so much fun. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's you, you can, you can, you don't have to worry about running out of tinder sources because you, like, you can use charred punk wood or other fibrous materials to catch embers. And so you can, you don't have to worry about a lighter or a, a ferro rod running out. You can just fabricate more, um, material and then another thing i have is um this brooch a, a blanket it's actually a blanket pin isn't it or something like that i'm not sure I've, I've seen them described as both um but typically what i use it for is for pinning my animal pelts up over my shoulders oh yeah um but i've seen different sizes and different variations of them that's beautiful that one yeah it's it's pretty durable and like 
again, like it, it, everything, you know, I try and have more than one purpose, you know, so you got like a little leather all that you could use to, to craft things out in the bush. And then um, you can t create a, tri a tripod using it as such, sticking some tr um, three limbs up inside of here and spreading it out. You got like a little tripod action going on there. Um, and then of course, what train rider or transient travels without a water key. So you can turn on the spigots that have yep. the valves turned off. Yep. And that one's got four selections for sizes. Very yep. good. Yeah. I don't see many like this one. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and then of course my water jug or water container. Yeah. Um, I carry one like that myself. Yeah. I like that because you can squeeze the air out of it. Yeah. It makes the water last longer yep. too. Yep. And you're quieter. You're not sloshing around when you're moving. Yep. Stealth land, staying low key. Um, yeah. Oh, very neat. Yep. And you carry a couple of blades with you. Uh, yep, that I do. Um, this is the and Scottish Dirk. Um, and then this is a, a Viking bearded axe. It's um, almost like a tomahawk, but with a longer blade. Yeah, and it's kind of handy because um, you can like, when you're processing wood, you can like kind of like scoop it and like kind of move it off to the side. You can manipulate it around a little bit by using that as a... Um, a fulcrum leverage point to like scoop. Yeah. Um, you can do it is kind of like the typical pocket knife for the Highlander. Um, the origins of this can do um, was kind of the the black knife, the armpit knife. Um, there's another knife that kind of goes in between the dirk and the skin do. It's called, I believe, called the skin accolade, and it's um, more like a hunting knife, like for skinning. And this would be like your everyday like tool knife and then your bushcraft knife that you would use. Um, this is... That's, the, good. That's good for going through the brush. It, yeah, it kind of works as like a machete idea. It does, yeah. Um, it's got that nice heavy blade for processing, batoning wood um, for campfire uses. Um, Seems to me you've got everything you need and nothing you don't. Yeah, I mean, I'm all about the lim uh, minimalistic primitive skills. Uh, retaining the ancestral skills that our ancestors used for all these years and mysteriously have forgotten. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, very cool. Keep life simple. You bet. Live free. And then another food gathering implement, um, Aboriginal throwing stick. Boomerang. Yep. Yeah. Very nice. Yep. And then I got my... Oh, your billy can. My billy can. My <clears throat> coffee press. <laughs> Clean to boil water in and whatnot, um, so, like such. You'll probably pick that up and show it to us. Yep, that's called a shepherd's sling. Um, kind of like the same type of sling that David and Goliath would have used. Well, bring it out here in the sun a little bit better. Um, got to untangle it for a second. So the idea with this is you you take like a smooth river stone, right? And stick it up in that in that little pocket. And you take this little loop, stick it over your finger, and um, kind of let it hang, right? And then you can kind of like get the momentum, and as you get that that right point of release, you let go of that loose string, and you you let your um, projectile go at your rabbit or whatever type of small game you're trying to go for. Yeah, um, very cool. Yeah, and then I keep that in my. Um, Scottish man purse. Uh, it's called a sporn. Um, you'd wear it. I don't know this Scottish thing. You know they wear dresses and now they have purses. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but yeah, you'd, you'd you'd wear it on the front of your your. They call it the the apron, the front part of the the kilt, um, and it would it would hold your 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 yeah. rations, your um, your money, your um, depending on how wealthy you were, your, you know how big it was, you could fit more um, your, like. The other pouch I had in my belt um, had my fire kit in it, and so they would they would stagger their um, belt kit out through different pouches. Um, and then this one is unique in the way that it can be set up as a, a side bag, so you can cross carry over your shoulder when you're out in the bush. Yeah, very practical. Yeah. Yeah, nice looking too. Good yeah, deal. it's um, I got it from this native dude in Iowa, or not Iowa, Idaho. Yeah. Um, and I ordered, um, 
a quiver, a coyote quiver from him as well. I don't have it with me. It's with that Mongolian bow that I have yeah. that's stashed away because it's not hunting season. Um, but yeah, that concludes my Highlander traveling kit. A nice kit. Thank you. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Meeting Michael and learning about another culture. And once again from Brit, Iowa, we'll see you around. around.